Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming. This is going to be a really uh, important and fun session, both. My name is Joshua Sharfstein. I am the Associate Dean for Public Health Practice and Training. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, one of a series of seminars we're having this year with our Centennial Policy Scholar, Congressman Henry Waxman. Um, this, uh, today we'll be talking about HIV AIDS in the United States and Baltimore and focusing on the federal uh, strategies around HIV and AIDS. And it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, senior faculty member and department chair who has organized and will be leading the discussion. Um, before I do that, I want to thank uh, Ellen McKenzie and Health Policy and Management for overseeing the Centennial Policy Series and Francis Henkel, who is an alumna who um, has sure? helped uh, uh, make this all possible. Um, and I'm going to uh, now introduce uh, David Holgrave. He is the professor and chair of the Department of Health Behavior and Society. Um, he also serves as vice chair of the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS. Previously, he was in the faculty of the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory and served as the director of the Division of HIV AIDS Prevention at CDC. Um, anybody who knows uh, Dr. Holgrave knows his, of his incredible expertise and enthusiasm um, for uh, making the United States uh, live up to its potential on HIV and AIDS. He's been relentless, um, and uh, it's not just the number of exclamation points in the emails. It's <laughs> all of the work that um, he has done at multiple levels as an ally uh, to local government, I can say in Baltimore, to state government, I can say in Maryland, and really to the federal government that has made his contributions so important. So thank you, Dr. Holgate, for organizing this today. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharfstein. It's really a, a, a pleasure to be able to be here, and uh, thank you for uh, all of you joining us uh, uh, today. Uh, I think this is an incredibly important discussion, and uh, also wanted to not only thank um, Health Policy and Management for, uh, thank you, uh, for their partnership in making today's session happen. Uh, Josh, thank you so much personally. It's been great working with you in partnership, and uh, thanks to Nick and Susan and Andrea and Regina and others who've really made today possible. So thank you very much. Um, and it's my uh, real pleasure to get to moderate uh, the session along with Josh today. And let me just say a, a word of kind of housekeeping of how we'd like to do this. We, we rather than having formal presentations, we're going to have this all be a discussion. And we hope that you'll be, uh, be interested in uh, participating in that discussion. And we thought the easiest way to do it is that if you have a question as we go through, uh, please email your question uh, to public health practice, all one word, public health practice at jhu.edu. And we're monitoring uh, that um, email address here and um, uh, we'll uh, bring those questions into our discussion. Also, if you happen not to have uh, your um, uh, smartphone <coughs> with you, or if you're like me where this is your smartphone, uh, then uh, you can simply raise your hand and uh, someone will bring a three by five card to you and uh, you can uh, write your question on, uh, on that. Uh, so uh, we hope that you'll participate in one of those ways as well. Um, we have a tremendous panel today, and we wanted to talk a bit about the national HIV and AIDS strategy and sort of how the history of the Ryan White Care Act, earlier histories of legislative work have um, helped feed into the development and uh, help us realize the future of the national HIV and AIDS strategy. And uh, you all should have a handout, I think, in front of you, just a two-page handout. And on the one side, uh, you'll see that it's a summary of the national AIDS strategy as updated by President Obama uh, in this July. And it really focuses on uh, right people, right places, and right practices, uh, trying to make sure that we're going to the communities most heavily and disproportionately impacted by HIV, having programs in place that are the most uh, highly impactful, um, and uh, that we uh, also focus um, in the areas of the U.S., uh, the southern U.S., which is very disproportionately impacted, and major urban areas across the country as well. And on the reverse side of this handout, you'll see the 10 indicators from the uh, National HIV and AIDS Strategy. And as we go through our session today, we'll kind of touch on each of those indicators a little bit. And I think uh, many of you uh, in the room I know, and I know that you work on HIV and AIDS, um, know that there's really four big parts to the strategy. Uh, one part focusing on increasing access to care. 
uh, and there are a number of targets related to improving our access to care in the U.S. Only about 30 percent of people have suppressed viral load who are living with HIV, so we have key um, challenges there. A second part is reducing HIV incidence. And the way that's manifested in the national strategy is that we would improve diagnoses uh, and improve awareness of serostatus. Um, and then quite rightly, a third key piece of the national strategy focuses on uh, reducing health disparities, uh, very broadly defined. And uh, we'll, we want to uh, touch on that uh, importantly as we go through. And then also uh, the last piece is on coordinating our efforts better across the federal, state, and local levels, as well as across different agencies in the federal government as well. And I should also say coordinating with the private sector as well, too. So um, those, I know um, uh, everyone in the room is already familiar with those segments of the strategy. And we'll divide our discussion today. We have until 1 o'clock, and we'll kind of do roughly 30 minutes or so on each of those different uh, parts of the strategy, probably spending more time on care, given its centrality uh, in the strategy. So let me then, uh, before I start uh, asking um, uh, some kickoff questions, uh, introduce the panel. It's really a, a great honor to uh, get you know, to introduce uh, Congressman Henry Waxman, who, as Josh said, is the centennial policy scholar here in the school. And uh, he truly is one of the most accomplished legislators uh, in the Congress of this or, or any era. Uh, he represented California's 33rd district for 40 years. And his legislative accomplishments have included the Ryan White Care Act, the Hatch-Waxman uh, Act on generic drugs, as well as improvements to the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act, among many, many others. Um, and his oversight of the tobacco industry truly forever altered um, the nation's perception of cigarettes and has made a real a lasting difference in uh, uh, everything related to combustible tobacco in the U.S. Um, he uh, now uh, is uh, the chair of Waxman uh, Strategies, a public affairs and strategies communication firm, and he's doing uh, some really important, very selective projects on public policy and continues to advise uh, people around public health and public policy strategies. Uh, we feel extremely fortunate at the school, uh, Congressman, that uh, we're one of the partners in, in that strategy to be able to get a chance to interact with you. So thank you so much. Um, and also let me introduce uh, Professor Tim Westmoreland. Uh, we're very uh, happy that Tim joined us. Uh, uh, professor uh, Westmoreland is Professor of Law and Public Policy at Georgetown University. Uh, among his other previous roles, he served as the Director of Medicaid uh, in the Department of Health and Human Services. He's been counsel to uh, Coop Kessler Advisory Committee on Tobacco and Public Policy, and he's advised an important firms such as uh, AMFAR and Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, he also served as counsel to key committees in Congress, including the Subcommittee on Health and Environment in the U.S. House uh, under the chairmanship of Congressman Waxman. So thank you very much. Um, also, let me then uh, I I continue to move down the panel and uh, introduce uh, Shruti Mehta. Professor Mehta uh, is professor of epidemiology in the school and director of our infectious disease uh, concentration here in the Bloomberg School. Uh, her work in uh, HIV and HCV has focused on uh, persons who inject drugs with a major focus on access to care and treatment, both for HIV and HCV. Um, and very importantly, she leads the longitudinal cohort study of uh, persons who inject drugs, the ALIVE cohort. So Shruti, welcome. Um, and also, it's a, a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ronald Valdeseri. Um, uh, I'm uh, personally happy to say that uh, in 1991, uh, for better or worse, uh, Ron hired me to my first full-time job in <laughs> HIV at CDC, uh, and it's been a great pleasure to get to work with Ron for the last quarter century. Um, Dr. Valdeseri is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health, Infectious Disease, and Director of the Office of HIV, AIDS, and Infectious Disease Policy at the U.S. Uh, Health and Department of Health and Human Services. Previously, he was the Deputy Director of the National Center for HIV, STD, and TB, um, NCHSTP, at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He also played critical leadership roles around HIV at the VA before then turning to his current position at HHS. And importantly, in the history of HIV, Ron led the first randomized control trial of an HIV prevention intervention uh, in the literature uh, that was back in the uh, late 1980s. So Ron, welcome. 
And uh, last, but most certainly not least, let me uh, welcome Dr. Errol Fields. We're very pleased to say that Dr. Fields was a uh, graduate of here from the School of Public Health uh, and also holds his medical degree. Um, he serves on the faculty uh, in medicine now as an assistant professor uh, and is on the Leadership Education in Adolescent Health or LEA program. Uh, his work has focused here in Baltimore, especially on serving people living with HIV and adolescents and especially young black gay men, a uh, community very disproportionately impacted in the United States. Um, and he also provides clinical care and consultation uh, in the Harriet Lane Clinic of the Hopkins uh, Children's Center. So Errol, welcome as well. Um, so you can see we're really excited about uh, this panel today. And I, I thought what we would do is just really open up each question to, to members of the uh, panel. I won't uh, call on people, uh, but uh, if, if you don't mind, Congressman, I'll start with you and, and Tim maybe, and then, we'll, and then we'll open it up from there. How can we believe you when you say something? So, <laughs> I'm gonna take it right back that very second. Uh, and uh, is that good training for DC? <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, I think the first question that I wanted to ask, uh, we touched a little bit on in the webcast this morning, and thinking about the 25th anniversary of the Ryan White Care Act, and um, uh, you and Tim were such key architects of the Ryan White Care Act uh, 25 years ago, and the hearings, as we were talking about this morning, went uh, for seven or eight years even before that as well. And I wonder if you wouldn't mind kicking us off by reflecting a bit on the history of the Ryan White Care Act and especially thinking about how it relates to the Affordable Care Act, another um, uh, key piece of legislation that you and Tim have been just so central in helping to, to craft. But do you mind kicking us off there, please? Sure, I'm happy to. The, uh, the Right and White uh, Care Act was adopted 25 years ago, 1990, and uh, it was a culmination of many years of hearings and investigations about what was happening with this epidemic. We started off in 1982 with the very first hearing on the subject at the Gay and Lesbian Service Center in Los Angeles after we had heard from the Centers for Disease Control that, that they didn't know AIDS, but they knew a rare form of cancer called Kaposi's sarcoma was affecting gay men and it was multiplying geometrically in uh, New York and San Francisco, Los Angeles. We wanted to know more about it and we had an introduction at that hearing, but then we held 30 or 40 hearings after that to find out what was going on in the research area, what was going on in the healthcare area to deal with the epidemic. It resulted in the Ryan White Care Act, which has a, a, a number of parts to it. it we wanted to encourage uh, counseling and uh, having people come in to get tested when we were able to ha have tests to identify the HIV status, and we wanted to be sure that people had medicines. In the beginning, there was no medicine, medication at all. The, the, design, <coughs> the designation of having AIDS was a death sentence, but eventually we were able to keep uh, people alive with the antivirals like AZT, which was the first one, and, and to stop the transmission from HIV into full-blown AIDS. Uh, and so uh, part of the law was to make that uh, those pharmaceuticals available to people, especially people who didn't have insurance. When uh, gay men and, I, and IV uh, drug users, primarily the first victims of this disease, there were others from blood transfusions as well, uh, when, they, uh, when, they get, when they were uh, in, aff affected by uh, HIV and AIDS, uh, they, there were no laws to prevent discrimination. There were no laws to prevent uh, privacy. And you can imagine uh, a, a gay man who uh, would face not only loss of job, loss of health insurance, but maybe face a criminal accusation because to engage in uh, gay sexual activities was a felony in many states in this country. So we lived at a very different time in the in the 80s, and uh, it wasn't until, not the, not the Ryan White Act, but the, the uh, Americans for Disability Act, where we stopped the discrimination, we did provide confi confidentiality in the Ryan White Act, I believe, didn't we, Tim? Yeah. We did. And so we wanted to do a number of things to focus on how to deal with people who are living with AIDS, 
And we wanted to increase the research money as well at uh, the National Institutes of Health or through the NIH to researchers around the country. The Ryan White Act uh, uh, evolved even after it was adopted, and it became the safety net. Before the ACA, we were dealing with people who couldn't get insurance if they had uh, HIV or AIDS, uh, they had a pre-existing condition, so they were discriminated against by insurance companies. They often couldn't afford insurance. Uh, we even had the anomaly of people who were infected who couldn't get the drugs under Medicaid because they weren't eligible for Medicaid until they got the disease AIDS. So it was a, a ridiculous situation where people were, were forced to become an AIDS patient uh, when we could have stopped HIV from becoming AIDS. It was a safety net program, and now that we have the ACA, it's a safety net under the safety net, as Kim Westmoreland pointed out in our interview earlier, that uh, even with the Affordable Care Act, we need this safety net program in states where they expanded the Medicaid program because Medicaid doesn't deal with all the services that Ryan White provides. And in states where they're, uh, the, the states, we, we never envisioned this, but in light of the Supreme Court decision, saying the states had the decision that whether they were going to expand their Medi Medicaid program, we wrote the law on the idea that they were going to do it because if they accepted Medicaid, they ex accepted the whole program of Medicaid, but the Supreme Court said no, they could have Medicaid, but whether they want to expand it, each state could decide for itself. And many states have not expanded the Medicaid program. And some of the states in the Union in the South, where there's a very, very a severe problem, uh, where people are not eligible for Medicaid, and they still uh, look to the Ryan White, Ryan White program as their sole source of support. It will be interesting to see what will happen in the future uh, in healthcare in this country. But uh, the, the Ryan White Act still plays a very essential role uh, in, in the insurance system, even when there is private insurance, even when there is a Medicaid. Thank you. Professor Westmoreland? Um, I think, uh, well, first of all, let me associate myself with the remarks from the gentleman from California. <laughs> <laughs> um, but secondly. Incorporate my comments by reference. Yes, I, I will incorporate. Um, the first thing that I would say is that um, in the early days of the AIDS epidemic, as Henry was saying, there was very little that could be done for somebody who found out that they were sick. Um, there weren't, weren't treatments. And so most, most, most of the early work in the Congress was towards improving biomedical research funding and public health funding at NIH and CDC and the other agencies. Um, but come the mid-80s, um, when drugs were available to prevent opportunistic infections and eventually drugs to slow down the progress of the virus, um, it became obvious that there was something that could be done and that the first step needed to be getting people to come in for counseling and testing. Um, this was a sort of watershed moment, uh, hard to remember these days, but that um, the affected communities at that time felt that testing was something that was used against them. Um, that many of the most homophobic or conservative politicians wanted to round people up, wanted to identify. They were publishing op-eds in the New York Times saying these people should be tattooed. Um, not in the same fashion as tattoos may have reached in the 21st century, but tattooed <laughs> for identification purposes. Um, and so the first effort was to try to convince the affected communities that testing was something that could be used for them as well, that it could be the first on, the first step onto healthcare services that would really help prevent opportunistic infections and, pre and prevent the progression of the disease. And to do that, we needed to turn towards trying to help uh, protect confidentiality and protect privacy. But it's, again, hard to remember. It was a time of such virulent homophobia and such easy opposition to this um, that this was a long, hard fight to try to pre first prevent the, uh, the uh, discrimination and the confidentiality breaches that would come with testing, but secondly, to then convince the affected communities that they really wanted testing um, because it would be something that could help them get health care services. Then the next step, of course, was to pay for the health care services, and the health care services were quite expensive and hard to find at the time. So the Ryan White Act was uh, to do all of those kinds of things to begin with, and it was a sort of 
effort to be comprehensive in reversing the way that the nation had responded to the epidemic to be, uh, in the earliest days of it. If, if I might add uh, another context to the testing, um, and again, some, some of you will know this and some of you will not, um, even the scientific community was not aware of what the significance of antibody seropositivity was. So if you go back and into the library and look at some of the earliest uh, documents coming out of a consensus conference at NIH, because the natural history of HIV had not been well studied, uh, there was a question about what was the significance of testing antibody positive. Did it mean, in fact, that someone would go on to develop full-blown AIDS? Of course, now we know the answer to that. But, I, you know, I have to add into that as, as being involved um, with the uh, multicenter AIDS cohort study in Pittsburgh, uh, when the test first became available, we had a lot of discussions about the ethics of should we let the research subjects find out whether they're positive or not. And they actually had to sign a piece of paper saying, we want to know the results of our test. So in addition to the homophobia, uh, which was palpable, the hysteria, the fear about AIDS, there were some basic um, elemental questions related to the natural history of HIV that weren't w well understood that made it even more complicated. Um, that's why it, it was so important to have a study like the MAX. Um, I'll put in a plug to say we do not have a similar longitudinal cohort study to look at the natural history of hepatitis C virus. Um, just a, just a, a plug there, since I know we're going to talk about hepatitis C later on. But, but anyhow, I just wanted to add that piece as well. No, that's good. Thank you very much. Uh, Errol, Trudy, let me, let me um, broaden the question a little bit and then open it up to the, the entire panel. I, I think. Um, when, when I look now at the, the 10 indicators for the National AIDS Strategy, five of them are related to the care uh, section of the strategy, and they include things like uh, getting linkage to care up to 85 percent, um, awareness of HIV seropositivity up to 90 percent, uh, viral suppression to at least uh, 80 percent uh, from uh, where we're at now, and to address homelessness so that no more than uh, 5 percent of persons who are in medical care who are homeless. And also, for the first time, the national strategy addresses death rate very uh, specifically to make sure that, that uh, the death rate decreases by uh, 33 percent. And I wonder if I could ask the panel sort of generally, thinking about the services that are covered under the Ryan White Care Act, some of the uh, supportive or complementary services, uh, how does that relate for you in the work that you do to uh, trying to achieve some of these care-related goals in the national strategy? What role does it play? Are there, are there still uh, pieces of that, and if we're thinking about the future, um, do we still need the Ryan White Care Act? What pieces of it do we need the most? So let me open it up and see who would like to comment. Please. Errol, please. Um, so I'm a, an adolescent medicine provider, so I see patients, young adults um, who have HIV. Um, and I think um, one of the things, the benefits we've seen from ACA is that a, number, a lot more patients are insured at this point. Um, but a lot of them are insured on Medicaid programs, and they're often dropped from Medicaid for various reasons. Um, and so oftentimes, the patients will come in and will not have insurance. So Ryan White continues to be an incredible safety net for those populations of, of patients. Um, but the other thing that, we've, that I've seen day in and day out is that even with the financial burdens lowered by um, either ACA or Ryan White, there are a number of competing priorities that these young folks face and that many people with HIV face that oftentimes are more important in the moment than taking your medicine or making it to your treatment appointment. Um, we have patients that have housing instability who have, or the difficulties in general with transitioning to adulthood, but they have uh, housing in, in, uh, instability, food insecurity, don't have a job, um, may have children that they're raising. And so all of the support services that Ryan White offers um, allows us to have case management, allows us to have social work, and allows us to have many of the things that insurance wouldn't cover. Um, so it continues to be an incredible safety net for these populations. Um, the other uh, component that, um, um, that, that I've seen is that even when, with the benefit of Ryan White or the benefit of ACA covering uh, patients until they're 26 under their parents' insurance is great for many, um, but a number of patients are concerned about confidentiality. 
um, and they're worried that um, they haven't disclosed to their parents their status, and they're worried about explanation of benefits being sent home, which would disclose their status unwittingly. And there are some strategies that you can call the insurance company and ask them to send the um, EOBs elsewhere, but that's not 100%. And so we had a lot of patients who um, needed Ryan White because they weren't um, able to use their parents' insurance. It's, it's, it's a, so it's a, it continues to be a very important safety net for this population. Trudy? So I would echo those comments, and my focus and, and work has been primarily with people who inject drugs. And, and you know, I think in the United States, in that population, we've seen incidents decline, um, but they face challenges with respect to retention. And I think in terms of the HIV care continuum, in general, across populations, this is the biggest challenge we face across the board in retaining people in care, keeping them suppressed on ART, both for their own individual benefit and population. Um, level benefit. And so I think, again, that supportive service aspect is what's critical for drug users and all of those populations because, as Errol mentioned, it's not just the HIV or the hepatitis C. It's the housing. It's the unemployment. It's the insurance. And we see the same thing in, in um, the ALIVE study of injection drug users that people get on insurance, but they come on and off because they have to maintain all of these, you know, aspects of their life. And it's interesting. You know, we looked for a long time, one of the advantages of a long-term cohort study which though it was funded for HIV just in response to Ron, one of the things that we've been able to do is yeah. study the natural um, history of hepatitis C. Drug users. Yeah, <laughs> Not among, among the drug users, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, and so what we see, you know, we tried for a long time to say, you know, when someone initiates therapy, can we predict what's going to happen? Can we predict the people that are going to stay on therapy, remain suppressed because you know we have 10, 15 years of follow up? Invariably, no. There's nothing that there's not a single thing that we can say that's different about the people when they start, you know, that predicts that long-term pattern. What does predict is what happens in the six months before they interrupt. Mm -hmm. You know, we find that most people stop at some point, they rebound, and then eventually they get back on, but it's the homelessness, it's the incarceration, it's the unemployment, it's those things that happen in that immediate time period that predict people interrupting. And so again, I think it just reinforces that having those wraparound services, and, and that's, I think, the key role that that Ryan White can play. Yeah, I, w I wanted to amplify, certainly the, I think the, the safety net question is a, um, obvious, yes, we still need it, but I, I would go one step further and say, um, not only has Ryan White program been a safety net, I think it's been an exemplar of how we deal with disease and health in a comprehensive manner, and we don't have very many of those in this nation. And the fact that Ryan, the people who put Ryan White together understood the importance of social determinants of health, we might not have used that same terminology back then, <laughs> but they understood the importance of food stability and housing and employment and legal aid. And I think that's why you do see better outcomes in terms of viral suppression uh, among clients enrolled in Ryan White compared to every person in the US who has HIV. So I would kind of step back and say, yes, we need it, but I think we need to learn some lessons there. Uh, and that, to me, is the, the major challenge. Uh, because you can, if you've got a categorical program uh, with resources, uh, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's easier to deal with those and, and reimburse those other components than when you're trying to stitch together a comprehensive approach. But I, I contend that Ryan White is a, really an example of how we should routinely address serious chronic disease in the United States, especially for vulnerable populations. I think it's interesting, Ron, it sounds to me like you're laying out that Ryan White is the first accountable care organization, um, <laughs> that it, it does have comprehensive yeah. services wrapping around in this way that um, it doesn't have shared savings and those kinds of things that go with Medicaid dis demonstrations, but yeah. still working around the um, working around the beneficiary in a way to make sure that everybody's working towards the same quality goals. It's yeah. an interesting yeah. point. And, I hadn't thought and, of it. And also the the health literacy and the centrality of the client. I mean, if you're a doctor, you might say the patient. If you're another provider, you might say the client. But the centrality of the client. Uh, which again, when you look at the chronic disease literature, you see people talking about how important that is, but um, any of us who have been through healthcare systems know that when we're patients or clients, we're not always in the, the middle of things. So I, 
I do think there's some really important lessons there. Uh, the, the, the challenge is how do we spread that out yeah. uh, into other uh, disease states to improve health? So I, I think um, uh, Josh and I agreed that what we, how we would do the co-moderating is that uh, he would monitor social media and the website and then come up uh, to the podium and, and, and uh, ask questions. And Josh, as you're coming up to do that, um, Congressman, can I ask you one additional question? We, we've touched on housing a few times already, and it's, it sort of struck me through the years that the Housing Opportunity Program for People with AIDS um, it's been uh, relatively flat funded for a long time and that there's, there's sometimes not as much of an uh, appetite in D.C. for uh, housing programs or, or funding of housing programs. And I'm just wondering if you'd be willing to reflect on that a little bit, sort of funding for HOPWA programs and other kind of housing programs and, you know, building uh, bipartisan support around uh, trying to expand those over, over time, if that's a fair question. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a fair question because Sometimes we put uh, different aspects of treating people in silos and not recognizing that there are other problems that are going on at the same time. Uh, and and I, th I think uh, we're seeing, as a result of a lot of factors, including the Affordable Care Act, trying to push health care, not just for those who get their insurance through the private insurance market, which was the focus of so much attention, but through Medicare and private insurance, to uh, look at a comprehensive aspect of, uh, of health care. I know in the Medicaid program, uh, dealing with the waiver that states often come in to ask the CMS to approve, many states, my state in California, uh, is talking about a whole person care. And you can't talk about whole person care without looking at housing and other aspects of it. But when it comes to funding a lot of these things, we do have a very short-sighted uh, approach by many people in power. Uh, we put uh, caps on the appropriated uh, programs, and uh, as a result, there's a sequestration, uh, there's shortchanging a lot of these efforts, and uh, I hope, as uh, it was interesting that Tim said the first affordable care organization, if we look at affordable care organizations, the idea of, of it is to pull health care and along with other needs together, especially for those who have chronic diseases, so that uh, there's, there's money to be saved, better care to be delivered, more quality and not just quantity, but we have to look at the, uh, the overall needs of the patients or the clients. Thank you. So the question that we got was, how did that come to pass for HIV? And it's been, you know, we're, we're a more comprehensive look at uh, patients and access to s support for all these different services. You know, was it accidental? There was a certain amount of money in there and it turned out that it was available and there was flexibility? What is it, you know, w what did you know at the time that Ryan White was being passed that um, could you have foreseen that it would be such a critical safeguard for all these different services? And if so, on, on what basis? What, what, what did you learn? What was the process to understand? <laughs> if you knew it, you didn't tell me at the time. <laughs> no, it wasn't that the money was there in advance. Um, I have to say um, one of the most under-discussed topics when we get into public health and medicine in this is how active the patient population, the beneficiaries, the advocates were um, in making the money be there. And to that extent, um, Ryan White, like much of the um, AIDS funding in other areas, has benefited from the uh, distinctness of the uh, diagnosis of people being able to say, this is what I'm going for. And Ron earlier mentioned um, having the, both the perils and the benefits of having categorical yeah. funding, that something is specifically about one topic. And it's a balance uh, from the political perspective from Congress, I think, over and over again, that you benefit when the Congress knows what it's buying. So if you can say this is about AIDS, um, then the Congress recognizes which kinds of things are problematic. But having done that, you've then created, as Henry was saying, a silo, um, that it's, not ab it's about AIDS and it's not about hepatitis. Um, but if the Congress, if you in turn decide to say, okay, this is about preventive health, and I have a specific preventive health block grant at CDC in mind, 
The Congress doesn't know what it's buying. It's buying something in one state and not in another state, and it's milk, and milk products in one state, and it's fluoridation in another. And the, funding, and the funding plateaus and eventually dries up. So you've got this constant political tension between you need to make sure that the Congress knows specifically what it's buying so that you can drum up support, but you can't at the same time create silos that are so rigid that you can't allow um, supportive, cooperative, complementary targets and services at the same time. So um, I'd like to take a crack at that question from a non-legislative perspective. David already hinted at how old I am. Um, so I have been working on um, AIDS before it was AIDS, called AIDS, uh, and my perspective will be from the non-legislative point of view. Um, to answer that question, I think one of the reasons why the Ryan White Care Act uh, was so comprehensive and far-sighted. I'm not talking about the funding, really important, but another issue. But in terms of laying out a vision for comprehensive care is that as Congressman Waxman noted, there was scrupulous attention paid to the needs of clients. And that doesn't always happen when we're developing programs, whether those are prevention programs or uh, medical care programs. But people actually listened to what was happening to these populations. And it became apparent that there were legally, I mean, people were being discriminated against uh, because they had AIDS. There were issues of people not being able to feed themselves, house themselves. So the fact that the people who put this together, and two of the very important people are on the podium here, listen to what the, the population, affected population said they needed. So I, I don't, that might seem obvious, but it doesn't always happen when we're developing programs or even when legislation is being created. So I wanted to put that aspect yeah, that's in a, that's it as That's an well. interesting observation because we weren't thinking about the overall picture. We were thinking about dealing with people who were uh, living with uh, HIV and AIDS. And so we wanted it focused on those people to get the care they needed. Contrast that with uh, block grants where we really don't know what we're buying, which means that there's less support for it, which is one of the reasons politically why a lot of Republicans like to take federal programs, make them block grants. Then it, you don't know what the states are doing, and if you don't know what the states are doing, you can start reducing the money to the states. And, uh, and, and, and from a, a particular point of view, conservative point of view, eventually eliminate the federal dollars and say, it's the problem of the states, it's the problem of the counties, it's a problem of someone else other than the federal government. But this was created not with the intention of having it move in the direction it has, but a focus on people living with HIV AIDS and making sure they get the different care that they needed, whether it was ph pharmaceutical care or other kinds of uh, services. Um, one of the other things that's, uh, I think, a historical anomaly, but that Ron is referring to, is almost the way that we backed into that discussion of patient-centered focus, which was, um, I keep harking back to the time of uh, dislike of who was getting sick, um, homophobia and hating the people who were injecting drugs and those kinds. And, at the and that was prevalent in Washington at the time, in both the executive branch and the Congress. So in trying to figure out whom to give this money to, um, in order to get money to the, pe to the um, people whom we thought would deal with uh, people with AIDS, it really needed to be a way of getting things into a community. And so the grantees for the largest part of the title were the cities, not the states, because a lot of the governors in the states and the health, even some health officers in the states didn't seem like they were actually going to be doing the right thing with the money. So trying to get it into the cities into the cities, trying to put together an advisory and planning capacity among people who are going to be beneficiaries or providers to make sure that they would be focusing. So in some fashion, we I have to say, I think we backed into patient-centeredness because a lot of the usual authority figures were people that couldn't be trusted to deal with these populations. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
How, how much of it was related to just the advocacy from the clients themselves? I mean, I always go back to Hep C as well, part, and not, not, in, not just because of my own interest, but because it's, it's almost the, the optimal counterfactual example, right? <laughs> Similar population, but where we have almost nothing, and we often compare the HIV lobby versus the hepatitis C. How much of it is that? Because again, we always, from other disease perspectives, you think about how to achieve the same level of comprehensive care. Well, I think the constituency uh, that was facing HIV and AIDS in the early time when we were developing the legislation was a very significant. Uh, I remembered how uh, I was so impressed when some of the age groups said to the FDA, we have studied the FDA law. We know it as well as you do. And we know that you don't have to wait until a drug is proved safe and effective before you make it available. Right. And the idea of compassionate use of drugs right. came from their efforts. Right. It wasn't part of the Ryan White Act particularly, it was going to the agency explaining how uh, they shouldn't be so rigid. And I think uh, that was a, a huge impact uh, uh, in the thinking of a lot of the policymakers. I, I I also have to say that I think a lot of the early days of the AIDS epidemic affected people of all socioeconomic strata. Um, so rich people and poor people were being affected. And um, the fact that rich people couldn't simply buy the cure off the shelf mm -hmm. motivated a whole lot of people to become activists. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, it, once the treatments were developed and insurance companies started to pay for them, some of those same activists have uh, disappeared from the advocacy ground. I'm, I'm wondering, I'm going to take advantage of the knowledge on the panel because I'm, uh, I was around in the 80s, but I was pretty young. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering how much with the advent of biomedical approaches to prevention for HIV, PrEP in particular, I'm wondering how much of these lessons we've learned are around um, patient-centered wraparound services for those who are at risk or for those who are infected, how much of that we can apply to uh, PrEP for patients who are also sort of in the same socioeconomic yeah. position, like how much of that could we actually apply around providing those services? Because we know that um, the same barriers to care that creates the disparities in the, in the care continuum for those who are positive are the same for those who are at risk. So um, I think we can apply all of the lessons, uh, but with two important caveats. Um, the Ryan White program provided the resources and support for systems to address those issues. Part of what I think we're dealing with with PrEP now um, is definitely, not totally, but there's definitely a resource issue. Uh, and we also don't have systems set up to address that in a comprehensive way. And in fact, by legislation, Ryan White funds cannot be used to treat people who, so far as I understand, you guys correct me, who are not infected with HIV. So I think all of those lessons are extremely important. What I think what we're grappling with, with PrEP, uh, among other things, I mean, there are health literacy issues that you know about better than me. Uh, there are a lot of providers who don't understand the relevance or the role of PrEP in prevention. But I think we're also grappling with how do we pay for it, particularly for people who or are underinsured or uninsured, and the various systems that we need to put in place. Now, I think you know, at a clinic level, maybe in certain clinics and certain facilities, they're, they're dealing with it. But that's not the same as having a, a comprehensive approach, for instance, that could be transferred to serve uh, black gay men in the southern United States. Mm -hmm. So I, I think all the lessons are relevant, but I think we're grappling with those systems and reimbursement issues uh, in trying to push PrEP out. And as David noted, that is one of the four major focus areas of the updated National mm -hmm. HIV AIDS strategy. To it's not, you know, it's not the, the silver bullet. Mm -hmm. It's not the answer to everything but it absolutely can make a, a positive, substantial contribution to reducing incidence. Well, compare that, for example, to the fact that Medicaid, which is the healthcare service for most people that would become, uh, would, would need it and have eligibility for it, 
uh, was not available because people weren't eligible if they simply had HIV status. Yeah. So uh, the uh, Medicaid program didn't provide the, the drugs for people to avoid full-blown AIDS until they got full-blown yeah. AIDS. And once they had full-blown AIDS, then they were eligible for Medicaid. Uh, that, that, uh, that didn't make any sense, and finally we changed it through the Affordable Care Act, but until then we couldn't get that uh, change. It was, some, it was somewhat an, uh, analogous to the, the time we were expanding Medicaid itself to uh, uh, cover low-income pregnant women. Pregnant women who didn't have a child couldn't get prenatal care under Medicaid, even though she would be eligible for Medicaid under all the other tests, until she had the child because she had to then be on the Aid for Dependent Children program, when we had a link between the welfare program in order to uh, uh, get eligibility for Medicaid. That made no sense at all, and we got that change when Henry Hyde, who was the, 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 the strongest advocate for the, 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 the so-called pro-life position, the anti-abortion position, uh, joined with us because we said, how can this be if you're pro-life, not to allow a woman to get prenatal care before the baby is born? And he said, you're absolutely right, so we did expand the Medicaid program. That was one of the early expansions of Medicaid in the 1980s, and then we added more and more children, and under the Affordable Care Act, all links are completely broken uh, to any welfare category. If you will, uh, are, are below a certain income level, you are eligible for Medicaid as your, as your uh, uh, coverage, except in those states that then did not expand the Medicaid program. Now, uh, one of the interesting issues that we're going to have is whether Ryan White ought to be focused more on those states, mm -hmm. particularly in the South, which large gay black men, uh, or other African American men who have HIV, uh, for other, uh, whether they're gay or not, whether we ought to focus the Ryan White Act money there because they don't have Medicaid available to them, which is in a sense rewarding states that didn't choose to protect their own people. That's one argument. On the other hand, we're talking about people, not uh, the governors right. of the states. So that's an issue that we're going to be grappling with uh, fairly soon, I would think. Can I ask one more question? Please. Um, it's a two-part question. So um, with, given that with ACA, potentially some of the uh, HIV care costs are going to be um, handled by that as opposed to Ryan White, is it feasible or possible to think about using Ryan White for prevention? That's the first part of the question. And then the second part of the question is, can we, use, if that were to be the case, can we use some of the infrastructure um, that we have in place through Ryan White to create systems to provide PrEP? So similar to what New York State has done and Washington State has done around mm -hmm. providing drug assistance for PrEP as well as sort of the, the, the assistance that's necessary to um, actually run the, the, do the monitoring and have, have take care of the patients when they come in for visits that's not necessarily covered by other, by the, by Gilead, for instance, for their, their drug coverage. And, and as the panel is, is reacting to that, I'll just say to the audience very quickly, to the, uh, we very naturally have moved kind of into the uh, reducing incidence part of the national strategy and the three goals that are related to that and PrEP is such a, a key piece to that. So, Errol, thanks for moving us into, into that part of the discussion. And the audience, again, if, if you want to submit a question, it's either raise your hand for a three by five card or public health practice at jhu.edu. So I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to make sure that people. Do you want to I, I, do you want to comment on the um, issues related to opening up Ryan White legislation? Because I'll I, sure. I'll comment on the second part of the question. Um, let's start simply with the budget um, discussions, which is the current legis the current Congress is looking to cut uh, funding for almost every program that they can find their way to do so, um, and. It can be across the board funding like Henry, was, uh, cuts like Henry was referring to, just stupid sequesters, or it can be that they decide we don't need some programs anymore. Um, opening, and then of course the, the questions that Henry was alluding to of how to retarget Ryan White in the age of, aid of, in the age of ACA with some states not expanding. In the current Congress, I see nothing but danger signals coming from either across the board cuts, program elimination, or re, uh, retargeting um, in a sort of hardcore political way. 
Um, and as far as opening and and what particularly concerns me is I think people uh, living in Medicaid expansion states are taking for granted that there will be insurance substitution, whereas in a lot of the places that are targeted by the AIDS strategy, there's no Medicaid to substitute for insurance. So I'm particularly worried yeah. about that. A couple of comments um, related to that question. Um, I, th I think that um, I would start out by saying, going even further upstream and saying that we need a lot more information about what's happening in state Medicaid programs to support PrEP. We don't have that information across the board. And I think this, uh, since we're in an academic environment, I think it's a really important policy issue that academicians can look at, work with, maybe if not across the entire United States, begin looking at a state-by-state -state basis to what do we know about the actual uptake of antiretrovirals for pre-exposure prophylaxis. So I think we have to kind of start by um, getting more specific information about gaps. I mean, we, we can pretty safely assume there are some major gaps, but I think we need to do that. Um, then I think that what we need to do, uh, and, and CDC has already taken some steps in this direction. Um, they're not paying for drug, but they've recently put out a new program announcement to support uh, state and local health departments to build the, some of the various program components that would be needed for uh, delivery of PrEP. And I can tell you at a policy level, the National Association of State and Territorial AIDS Directors has raised the question, of course, they, they didn't say where the money would come from, but has raised the question of should we begin thinking about health departments as the payer of last resort for PrEP? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that would entail re shifting resources because, you know, again, there's no goose laying a golden egg. Um, but I, I think what I'm saying is I think there's a lot of space to move forward. I don't think we're going to solve this problem in one fell swoop, but I do think we need some more specific information that can shine a light on populations who could benefit from PrEP who are not getting access to it. Uh, and then maybe approach it in different ways, uh, including public-private partnerships. But I don't, I don't think there's going to be an easy fix. Maybe my fellow panelists might have other ideas. No, I agree with the need for ongoing data in yeah. addition to, to uptake and barriers and who could benefit the outcomes associated with it and places where there is uptake and there's yeah. not. Yeah. Um, you know, and that relates to the incident monitoring of incidents and new yeah. diagnoses yeah. and we, as hard as that is to monitor. Yeah, another plug for health departments. I mean, we have the, at least in terms of venue, maybe not from always from the client's perspective, but as you know, um, people who have a diagnosis, one of the most significant predictors of HIV seroconversion uh, among MSM is a recent uh, diagnosis mm -hmm. of gonococcal or chlamydial proctitis. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, we're seeing those people in STD settings, but the issue is we have to find a way to build that infrastructure. And I think, again, I think some states with resources are already beginning to do that, but the problem is it's not happening in states that that haven't, you know, might have the need but not the resource. And I'm sorry to keep sounding like a broken record on this topic, but I, I will. I mean, if you look at uh, the geographical areas and the target populations and the aid strategy, and then do an overlay of which states have not expanded Medicaid, you'd almost find a complete congruence there. The states that have not expanded yeah. Medicaid are the targets, mm -hmm. and the populations that are covered by the would-be Medicaid expansion of the ACA are the beneficiaries yeah. that are left out when you don't have yeah. the Medicaid expansion. And, and that's one of the reasons why categorical programs, um, including those at CDC and other areas, have been focusing more on the southern U.S. and using, I mean, it's a pretty harsh measure, but you can't deny it looking at death rates. Uh, among people with HIV, and uh, I don't, you may know a more recent analysis, mm -hmm. but a couple of years ago, 
CDC did an analysis showing that I believe it was nine of the 10 states in the US that had the highest death rates among people with HIV were in the southern United States. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a pretty serious indicator that things aren't going as well as they might. And, and I think just to expand on that point too, uh, now Baltimore, according to the last surveillance statistic, has the highest death rate among all cities in, in the U.S. And for our, our, it is, it's yeah. true. Yeah, in our uh, 130 to 3 panel, we're really going to focus a lot on Baltimore, and so we'll come back to uh, some of these issues. And, and PrEP, too, there's a key projects around PrEP that uh, we'll want to talk about related to, to Baltimore. I think um, just as we kind of um, uh, are on this uh, section of the national strategy about reducing incidents. There were three other goals that I just wanted to kind of remind us of and see if we have any comments of those three. Um, the first is to uh, increase the percentage of people living with HIV who know their status to 90%, to increase the number of new diagnoses by 25%, I mean, reduce the number of new diagnoses by 25%, and to reduce the percentage of young gay and bisexual men who've quote unquote engaged in high risk behaviors by at least 10%. And I wanted to just open up uh, all three of those to the panel and see if there are comments either about the behavioral measures uh, for young gay men or earlier today and in also earlier on this panel, we've touched on counseling and testing a little bit, which certainly goes to some of the issues around diagnoses as well. Um, just when we think about trying to meet these goals of the national strategy, any words of wisdom, suggestions about programs or policies that are really high priority to address any of those, uh, any of those three? So first, just just as the epidemiologist on the panel, I have to at least just comment on the changing, you know, to focusing on new diagnoses versus. I know that's that wasn't necessarily the question. New diagnoses versus incidents, which I I mean I understand the rationale for why that was done in the sense there's a delay with reporting of incidents and we have challenges in measuring incidents, but I worry a little bit about that metric just because diagnosis is so influenced by who gets tested, obviously, and so that, that, that underlying denominator, how that changes, you could just test a lot less or test really low risk people and, and particularly the, the diversity by state. So I just at least to, to highlight that, I think we will still continue to monitor incidents in different ways, and I th but I, I think you can't replace necessarily that marker with new um, diagnoses. Um, you know, the other thing I would say related to it, I think the challenge, you know, one of the, the great things with HIV is that there is testing integrated into so many settings where people encounter the system, you know, in ST places where people go for STI care and health departments, needle exchange programs, opioid substitution. I think that is one of the um, one of the things that has led to this improvement in terms of, you know, we're at 80% being aware of their status. I think the challenge is that 20%, right? And, and those are probably the folks that maybe don't access any service. So I think that, you know, and maybe they do, they eventually have an STI and go in, but, but we need to be getting them earlier. And so I feel like that's where we need to be the most creative in some ways is reaching out into the community and you know that's going to be challenging is it mobile testing is it expanding self testing is it peer based referrals what have you but i think that we're going to have to be a little bit more creative if we really want to get that 20% yeah. uh, one um, i think one thing that we can continue to work on and and this can be worked on at the federal level and also at the community level um, is trying to get more community health centers to implement routine HIV testing. I'm not talking about community health centers that are um, providing AIDS specialty care. I'm talking about the rest of the community health centers, and um, uh, some of you on the panel may know um, that there was a GAO report a couple of years ago that looked at uh, the uptake. In 2006 was when CDC said, you know, risk-based testing is missing too many people. Uh, they didn't say don't ask about risks mm. or ignore risk, but they said it's missing too many people. We just need to be routinely testing people who show up in healthcare settings. That was in 2006. Uh, sometime later, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force uh, came in line with that. But this GAO study, which was probably at least, at least five or six years after that, um, and it publicly available, you can find it online, indicated that um, there were still far too few community health centers that were doing routine HIV testing. Um, and I do think there's a federal role. I don't want to misrepresent my HRSA uh, Bureau of Primary Health Care colleagues uh, because we are exploring ways to 
um, try to incentivize that. The community health centers are a very decentralized model. Um, they do not, it's not like HRSA headquarters flicks a switch and tells them what to do. Uh, there's a, a substantial amount of local decision making about how they allocate their budget and what kind of services they provide. But I think that's a really, we haven't talked about that system. That's a really important system both for HIV as well as hepatitis C um, testing that I think we, we can try to think about how we can continue to incentivize that at a federal level, but I would say at a local and community level, all of these community health centers have local boards. Um, having people understand more about what, you know, what's the epidemiology in there. I mean, I think one of the issues is that if people don't see it, they assume it's not there, uh, which has been a huge problem yeah. with Hep C. Yeah. Um, so I think community health centers are an area where we definitely need to continue to push to get uh, routine HIV testing implemented. Could I uh, go back to the, the topic that, that we were just discussing about the categorical programs and how it all fits with the ACA? It's interesting to ask what does the federal system mean? What does federalism mean? Uh, a categorical program is one where the state, excuse me, the, the federal government says this is a program and we expect when we give money out, this is what they're going to do and it's, it's appropriated. And then uh, grants are given out and we fought hard over the years to maintain the categorical program is to avoid block grants. Because block grants are amorphous and you never know what they're doing. One state could do one thing, another state another, and then it gets dispersed, plus it doesn't have strong support for continued funding. I have always felt strongly we need to protect the entitlement programs. Uh, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, these are entitlement programs. People, uh, my colleagues often would say entitlements with a sneer uh, like it's the enemy of the economy. But the, the fact of the matter is, we want some people to be entitled. And when they're entitled, they get certain benefits. Now, we don't have a health care system for most Americans that's an entitlement program. We patch the programs through. Uh, uh, and uh, so sometimes they cover things, sometimes they don't. And if we don't have a Medicaid entitlement, because a state chooses not to expand that entitlement for its low-income population, if you use the categorical programs to fill in that gap, uh, it, it really indicates that uh, we haven't figured out who's responsible. Is it the local responsibility or is it federal? I tend to think that federal is very important. I never liked the idea that Medicaid is run by the states with such a wide variety, a ver uh, wide diversity of what the states do within certain bounds. Because if you're an American citizen, whether you live in Mississippi or New York or Maryland, you ought to be entitled to a certain range of benefits. And, and to say that a poor uh, African American child in Mississippi doesn't get the same benefits to grow up and hel be healthy that a same child would in another state doesn't make sense to me. It should be, if it's going to be run by the states, it ought to be clear that we want uniformity in it. So I, I'm just talking in, in a, a way of thinking through, we would rather have a categorical program than a block grant. If we have a categorical program, it really cannot substitute for the entitlements yeah. that people ought to have. Josh, any uh, questions coming in on uh, reducing incidence? Maybe Corey's going to come up to the mic so you can do a follow-up. Good questions to be asked before yep. I do the last one. I'll, I'll, I'll give one that Choices. comes from a couple places, which is that there was a comment made earlier, I think maybe Tim said that no matter social class, people couldn't get access to medicines, and that really affected the uh, politics around the, uh, the early days of, of, of AIDS. And it was really, it really is an incredible transformation from being a point, as you said on the webcast this morning, where nobody even mentioned the, you know, few people were talking about 
AIDS initially. The president didn't mention it for several years. To the point where you have such a terrific law passed that really helps so many people. Um, the, the epidemic today is, a, is um, in many ways concentrated among um, individuals who aren't of every socioeconomic class. And, and particularly if you're looking at um, untreated people and people who really need different services, it's often people who don't have some of the advantages of um, class, for example. And uh, how, what, how do we think about that in the context of, of the strategy? Is, there, is the, um, uh, is enough uh, built into the Ryan White Care Act to be able to address that? Are there additional changes that need to be made? And if the question is around incidents, then you know what is it? Re are there new things that need to be done? What what are the implications for advocacy to make a dent among, in incidents for people who are the most disenfranchised? Is that a fair way of asking the question? There, that's a good question. And it's a, it's a, it's a troubling one because you don't see anybody jump up and say, yeah, we ought to do this or that. This is not clear. If it's Ryan White money, it's not unlimited money. So uh, it's going to be difficult to use Ryan White as the, as the program, although it makes spent, it makes sense to expand the Ryan White program to do exactly that because we're talking about the same disease. Um, but, but uh, we're not talking about a Congress that sees res its responsibility to a lot of people who are now affected, uh, the very poor, minorities, uh, people who don't have access to things because their state didn't care that much about them to expand the Medicaid program. Uh, and in some ways, we're, if we do have Ryan White money, we have to hope that they'll use it the way we want them to use it at the local level, but I presume they would because we're somewhat fairly sophisticated uh, people. But I think the issue is going to be uh, if, it's, if it's a program where we need appropriated funds, whether it's Ryan White or anything else, it just becomes very, very difficult and there has to be an explanation to uh, the lawmakers, especially in Washington, that if you really care about people who, who are going to get uh, AIDS, uh, we've, got to, we've got to give a, a, an earlier intervention, which thank God we, we have the ability to do now that could stop uh, HIV, not just HIV going into AIDS. Um, I just wanted to say, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I just wanted to say that um, this is actually uh, making HIV, in my view, making HIV and AIDS um, into something that we're very familiar with in a public health law crowd, which is diseases of poverty. Um, and, you know, I used to work on lead poisoning programs. There's no reason we should have lead poisoning in this country, um, except that it doesn't affect people of all socioeconomic classes. Um, I still do a little bit of work on tuberculosis programs. There's no reason we should have tuberculosis in this country, but it's not um, evenly distributed by socioeconomic status. Um, we, poverty and public health are constant recapitulations of each other, and um, I think AIDS has, to the good fortune of biomedical research and a lot of people and a lot of public health, moved into a category of something that we haven't figured out a way of making the Congress and the government responsive to, which is when a disease disproportionately affects poor people, it doesn't get the attention it deserves. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't dream of um, suggesting how, how we would, well, let me strike that and say that I think in response to the question that um, I would also like to suggest that I do believe we have some capacity in programs outside of Ryan White uh, when we're addressing the issue of diseases of poverty. I don't think it's a solution, but that is why there is such a major emphasis in the updated, in the initial and the updated National HIV AIDS strategy to get the siloed federal programs across departments to work better together. I, again, I don't think it's gonna solve all the problems but there is capacity that can be tapped when there's better working relationship across the, not just within HHS, but across other departments like labor and justice and HUD. So I don't think we need to put it all on Ryan White, 
Um, but what I would say is I think that there's some capacity there to do a better job serving uh, disenfranchised people. Now, that will at some point reach a limit, and then we still come back to the issue of what's the state's responsibility because the Fed can't carry everything. But I think that there's probably more the Fed can do uh, to leverage its resources uh, by getting these programs to work together better. And this is such a, a great uh, segue as well. Oh, and Corey, let me uh, go to your question first, and then oh, I'll, sure. I'll segue to the next. Yeah, Corey, please. Um, I don't remember how what we were talking about before, but this this thought came, so I wanted to to raise this. Um, so I used to, well, I don't know. I used to say I used to be a preacher. I'm not sure if I still am or not. But <laughs> um, we used to talk about in ministry, like meeting the needs of people, and we would say, um, what is a what is a hungry person need? They don't need Jesus. They need food first, and you know so forth. So this idea, so I would say, what, what do disenfranchised people need? And my response, one of them would be power. And so my question is, how do we, how does the government, how do we create policies or something that um, gets power in the hands of people who don't have it? So for example, that they can um, transform systems that they really actually don't even want to engage with to the point where they're determining and deciding what places healing centers look like for them, which may not be hospitals and may not be doctors who require multiple blood samples, but you have to keep doing these appointments to go back and talk to the doctor to get an understanding of what even that all meant. And so um, I, 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 that's part of the question and, and it also is uh, connected with the idea, I think the recent demonstration grant to health departments um, to, to address PrEP and um, linkage to care and things like mm -hmm. that. In my estimation, and this is very a small look, mm -hmm. that money goes to a health department who's expected to connect with community agencies. Mm -hmm. But the power dynamic remains the same. Still, mm -hmm. the people at, at government levels who essentially are calling the shots and, you know, so that's, I'm wondering how do we change and how is that transformed? Uh, yes. So I was um, and listening to what everyone has said before your question and with this question I think what a lot of what we're talking about is um, HIV and other health disparities are more proximate outcomes of disparities in the social and physical environment um, and it, that sounds like what you're talking about as well. Um, I think that um, to take your example of the health department demonstration grants part of that um, Part of the role of that is for the health department to provide capacity building for community-based organizations. And so that's, that's a way of giving power to the community by helping them build the capacity to provide the services for, their, for community members by the community, so for the community, by the community. Um, and I think that's, in a lot of different ways, I think that's what we have to do in order to um, uh, change that disparity in the physical and social environment. Um, if you continue to have um, a lack of resources, a lack of knowledge, a lack of power, then that disparity is never going to change. The, the question is how do you develop the political will to infuse that type of skill development and capacity building development into those communities? I, I won't repeat what you said about capacity development. I agree with all of that. Um, I would say that um, as someone who's worked at at CDC uh, and most of the federal agencies have some level of resource going into capacity development. Um, I, I think it's a work in progress. Um, I think both from the federal level and the community level, there have probably been examples that have been successful and examples that people would say haven't been successful. But what I want to come back to is, you know, we're talking about HIV, but substitute uh, any other major health threat community mobilization must continue to be a component of what we do. And I mean, that's community writ large. There are a lot, there are a lot of communities, I mean, but to, uh, I, I just wrote something on this that, you know, even though we've had such tremendous advances in uh, biomedicine that really have enabled us to do a much better job and no one wants to minimize that, it would be a mistake to think that oh, well, we don't have to do com community mobilization now because we've got all these great drugs and we have PrEP. So I would say I don't think we have the perfect answer. 
uh, we need to continue to invest in, um, it, from my point of view, not cutting out health department, because I do think they're important players, but how do you really bring in community in a meaningful way? Uh, because it's really their health issues that we're all trying to address. Um, so I, I would say very important point, and we need to think about what kind of systems. I think there's some interesting models internationally. Um, of course, it's not the same as the U.S., but it doesn't mean that we can't learn from our international partners about ways in which community has been empowered and mobilized to improve health outcomes. And let me just say, too, I, we quite very naturally moved into the, the discussion of the third part of the strategy around health disparities. And you, as you saw in the handout that you have, the strategy really highlights a number of key populations, uh, uh, gay men, especially young gay men of color, uh, black women and men, Latino women and men, uh, persons who inject drugs, young people, and transgender women. And um, when you look at the goals for uh, reducing health disparities in the national strategy, there are two that you see. One is reducing uh, disparities in the rates of new diagnoses. And the last one is to increase the percentage of uh, young persons who inject drugs who are diagnosed with HIV um, to uh, be increasingly uh, in care and virally suppressed. And it, it raises maybe an issue of relating uh, some of the things we've been talking about, but for young people um, and youth as a kind of health disparity and also relates to injection drug use and HCV in some ways. And so I just wanted to raise that particular goal of the strategy and see if there are comments around our programs or policies around um, uh, serving persons who inject drugs and also maybe our coordinate, because the last part of the strategy we'll get to in a moment is coordination of services and how we start to coordinate across HIV, HCV, and other areas as well. Please, Daryl. Um, I, I wanted to, um, in, in the, going along with that question, but also stepping back a little bit to the questions you asked earlier, I wanted to talk a little bit about this, this uh, indicator, reducing the percentage of young gay and bisexual men who have engaged in HIV risk behaviors by 10%. Um, so that, I imagine, is primarily referring to young black gay, gay and bisexual men, because that's the population that has the highest uh, risk for HIV. And I was actually surprised by that um, indicator, because we spent so much time focusing on how risk behaviors are no higher in black MSM than other races. In fact, they may be lower. Um, uh, but in thinking about it, it really, um, even though the behaviors may be the same, the consequences are different, right? So um, the consequences for having unprotected sex if you are a young black gay man here in Baltimore are much different than if you than for a young gay white man in Towson, for instance. Um, so I see the reason for um, the focus on those risk behaviors. I, I, I don't know exactly how to do that. Um, I think in general, um, LGBT populations are sort of out there on their own. Um, young populations are kind of out there on their own. They don't have, um, there's not sex ed that tells you how to have safe sex um, with the same gender. There's not um, any PSAs really for focusing on how you kind of develop your identity as a young person. And so really they, they're out there on their own and don't have that support. Um, one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Renata Sanders, has done some work looking at um, how young, young MSM, black MSM, learn how to have sex, and really what their, their, their resource is is sexually explicit material or porn. That's where they're going to figure out how to have sex and how to have safe sex or not safe sex. And there's no, there's no, there's no other strategy, there's no other resources that they have. And then some of the work that I've done, there's because of the stigma that still surrounds sexuality um, in all communities, but also in the black community, oftentimes, same-sex behavior is underground, it's stigmatized. Uh, youth don't have, um, are not going to their parents. As a matter of fact, they're hiding it from their parents. So they lose the parental monitoring that we know increase, decreases risk behaviors in, the, in young adults, in adolescents and young adults. Um, and they're also sort of looking for community, but they're looking for that community in adult sexual spaces. So there's, there's a number, and I don't have a solution, um, other than to, um, to think about these further, but there are a number of ways in which these young people, black, white, Hispanic, et cetera, are sort of on their own and don't have the resources they need to, to decrease the risk behaviors that they have. 
to, well, to take to, no, no, it's okay. to, to take that question sort of with respect to drug use, and you mentioned, I think within drug, you know, I already mentioned the challenges related to injection drug use in general with one of the key barriers being retention and retaining people in care, but I think there's a real difference between the typical injection drug user that we think of in the U.S. and this new epidemic of injection drug use that we're seeing across the country. You know, so a lot of what we know comes from our long-term studies among older inner-city injection drug users, and what we're seeing now is this shift to, as many of us know, the prescription opiate injectors across the country, not just in urban centers, but suburban, rural settings, um, you know, and let, I think, the lessons we learned from Indiana, um, in a way, of, of kind of what happened there, and it particularly relates to not just considering HIV on its own, but hepatitis C and drug overdose. So Indiana was recognized in the press because it was HIV, right? And that was what, that was 2015, and 2011, the cases of hepatitis C spiked, mm. and before that, overdose cases spiked. And across the country, in West Virginia and Appalachia, we're seeing the same mm. patterns mm. in injection drug use with these with huge peaks. You know, the, the increasing incidence, particularly among young suburban injection drug users, with not much awareness in the press and not much being done. And in Indiana, needle exchange and things like that should have been scaled up in response to hepatitis C and overdose, but it wasn't until HIV came in that that happened and we could have prevented in part part of that epidemic so I think it illustrates just that HIV prevention and increasing you know preventing new infections increasing awareness of diagnosis early is going to require linking these different systems and being able to respond to hep C to overdose before um, before that because I think we may we haven't seen the similar a similar pattern in other parts I mean we've seen the hep C we haven't seen the HIV as much in these other settings but you know it just takes an introduction. Maybe let me. Oh, go ahead. Ron. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. What, one other point related to the um, the uh, increase in um, hepatitis C, which, by the way, CDC has reported over the last two <laughs> years of their most recent data, a 150 percent increase in acute hepatitis C infections which they do not consider to be reporting artifact. They consider it to be an actual increase in incidence. Um, I think, again, it's not a solution, but I do think it's a strategy. Uh, as Sh uh, Sh Shruti, sorry, as Shruti knows and others on the panel, um, the, uh, w what we're seeing among young injection drug users is directly tied to America's prescription opioid abuse epidemic. Um, they're directly tied together. Um, and I think one of the things that we can do is, and, and we've tried to do this at the federal level, is to increase the awareness among people who come at this primarily from the prescription drug abuse point of view, which is an important perspective. I don't want to minimize that. But they're not thinking about, they maybe think about HIV. They definitely don't think about viral hepatitis. So just trying to kind of make people aware that, you know, of course, overdose is, a, is the worst outcome, uh, and we want to prevent that, and we want to get people into treatment, but we also want to recognize the fact that as a result of injection drug use, people can develop these bloodborne infections like HIV and hepatitis C. So I think kind of expanding uh, the army beyond sort of the traditional HIV players. We've certainly had to do that with yeah. viral hepatitis because our army is so tiny. Right. <laughs> um, I, I think making, bringing that awareness to the fore is very important. Again, not a solution, but I think a strategy uh, that will help us make some inroads there and develop comprehensive approaches, not just approaches that focus on overdose prevention, but have a more comprehensive approach that understand all the bad health outcomes that can happen from injection drug use. And let me ask uh, a one final question around this topic of health disparities. I think that the national strategy uh, tries to walk a balance between a, a real heavy focus on serving communities where the, the disparity is clearly the greatest, yet informing the general public to a certain degree so that there's a background level of knowledge and support for programs as well. And I was uh, thinking about the, the webcast earlier this morning, Congressman, talking about the uh, Surgeon General Coop and the mailer to all uh, households in the United States. And I wondered if the, the panel had any comments about this sort of issue of 
really we want to take into account the, the tremendous health disparities and address them. And at the same time, what's the role of sort of providing knowledge and background information and also addressing stigma in the general population as yeah. well too. So I just wanted to open that. No, I mean, I think it's a critic. I mean, I think, you know, in some ways we've become maybe complacent about that just because we think that education has improved. I mean, it's 2015, you know, and in some ways we work in this world and you feel like people just know, you know, and that knowledge mm -hmm. should be better, you know, and it's just not. I think there's so much evidence that it's that it's not, you know, in the general population, again, we talked about youth, that there are, you know, these, these young prescription opioid users, yeah. I don't think they know much about HIV yeah. and hepatitis C at all, yeah. you know, and in terms of stigma, I mean, I just have to mention it just because it was in the news, but Charlie, she I mean, this is, it just, it raises Charlie Sheet and just what's happening around that just raises the, the issue of how much stigma there really still is. I mean, the way that that's presented yeah. in the media, but all of it, I mean, we know that, but it's just kind of a, a lens onto how much there actually is. So I don't have an answer to, to how we deal with it. I mean, there are lots of things we need to do, but I think there has been some complacency in terms of education, okay. potentially, yeah. 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 There, um, I think one of the, it's very interesting, they, they talk a lot, um, they talk somewhat in the guideline, on the strategy about ch um, modifying or reforming the criminal criminalization of HIV, essentially. Um, and I think that that's, that's really important because that's, that's sort of a systemic um, uh, stigma, right? So there's a, um, there was a young black gay man, 21 I believe, when he was arrested, 23 when he was convicted, but was convicted in Missouri for 30 years for exposing someone. And he said prior to his, um, you know, prior to, to his deposition, he was saying that I just didn't know how to tell people. I mean, he's a kid; he didn't really know how to yeah. deal with it. And so he's going to spend 30, year, 30 years in jail, and people think that that's okay. Um, and I think part of that has to do with we still don't have um, knowledge, even amongst our our, uh, our legal system about what HIV really is and how it's really transmitted and, and how um, if you criminalize it, people are not going to want to get tested. They're not going to want to disclose. They're not. They're, we're kind of creating the same thing that we had back in the 80s around this fear around HIV. So, I mean, I think that was really important. They talk about changing that in the, yeah. in the strategy. I, I think what, um, what both the previous speakers have mentioned um, just underscores that there's still plenty of work to be done. And um, that Part of this work is continuing to engage uh, with people beyond our typical um, aid service provider, um, kind of the usual cast of characters. Uh, and it is important. Um, the gentleman who, who is a preacher, <laughs> who got up, it is important to work with social organizations, with faith-based communities. You know, the, it might be a different hook. I mean, I think we have to understand, as you said, we have to understand what your, cons if, if you have a congregation, what are your major concerns about your congregation and kind of come at it from that point of view and then try to work in our HIV and viral hepatitis and um, STI agenda. But I, I do think we need to continue to work, as long as this is a problem and people are still getting infected and dying from HIV because they're not being diagnosed in a timely manner or not being retained in care. I mean, we wouldn't be having this discussion if, those, if that wasn't the case. As long as that's still happening, I think we need to continue to work with and reach out to these other parts of society to help us uh, address these health concerns. Sure, question came in having to do with the workforce needed to be able to accomplish some of these. I remember when I was at the health commissioner, I went to the um, HIV program at Hopkins University of Maryland and asked that every provider be able to prescribe buprenorphine to be able to take mm -hmm. care of addiction at the same time. And um, it wasn't the easiest conversation, yeah. even at places that were devoted to caring for HIV. I think. Um, uh, the Moore Clinic did do a lot more in that regard uh, over time. But um, what uh, the, the questioner asked, you know, there's a shrinking population. It used to be that, you know, there was just a, a bustling business in training doctors to take care of HIV. Fortunately, because of um, fewer sicker patients, there are not as many. But um, beyond doctors, what are the, and thinking also in terms of the conversation we've had about the different challenges that patients face, 
what are the what are the implications for what the healthcare workforce needs needs to be? How does it work yeah. with other issues? How does it work out in the community? Yeah. We'll, we'll address this, and then I'll come over here to the questions. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's not just shrinking, but it's getting grayer, as Hersa would say. That uh, a lot of the mm -hmm. providers who um, have have been on the front lines for the last two decades are, you know, they're not going to be working forever and they're getting ready to retire. I, I mean, again, I would say as a general response to that question, Josh, we we as a society, and it's not just the Fed, uh, it's all components of society, we need to continue to invest in understanding and developing better models of care. Uh, I think what you point to is a very specific example in terms of HIV, what happens when uh, we no longer have enough providers. I, I think that's a bigger question of what kinds of models of care can we put in place? I mean, internationally, as you know, this was dealt with through task shifting, trying to figure out well, what doesn't have to be an MD that deals with all components of care, what can a licensed nurse do, what can a community health worker do. So I, I think that that's an investment that the Fed needs to make. Uh, but I also think it's an investment that academia uh, needs to be involved in to, to try to not just think about, but look at ways to test different models of care. We can do it for HIV, we can do it for uh, injection drug users who have, you know, not only dealing with their own substance abuse issues, but other chronic diseases. But I do think that that means we need to continue to invest in those models. And we need to continue to teach healthcare students, whether they're doctors, nurses, pharmacists. I mean, we haven't mentioned that yet. Community pharmacists have been an amazing way to extend uh, care in, in places of the country where maybe there aren't a lot of specialists, but the community pharmacist can actually counsel a uh, person on antiretrovirals if they're having problems with symptoms and help them stay adherent. And that's been a model that has been used in the United States. So we got to think more broadly uh, about a team approach. Yes, please. Thank you. I'm Kenyon Farrell from Treatment Action Group. Um, so um, thinking back to I think the conversation about um, health disparities and I think this kind of conundrum that I think we're finding ourselves in in terms of you know, how much do we do um, targeted, you know, focused efforts, right, whether prevention or treatment or social marketing and those sorts of things versus m kind of broader, um, you know, more general strategies. And um, I think it's an interesting kind of line because I think given, like the, I watched the, you know, interview yesterday with Charlie Sheen, um, who, frankly, was better than I <laughs> anticipated, <laughs> right, in his announcement. All but it was Matt Lauer who, <laughs> yeah. it was the interviewer who, I mean, it was like the interview could have happened in 1998. Yeah. It was, yeah. I mean, he literally said, so you're on that triple cocktail. I, I mean, yeah. I, nobody's used that language in 20 years. So <laughs> I, you know, which I, which I think says something about the kind of, um, you know, the baseline of, of information about where we are um, you know, in terms of what treatment means, and even the questions about being virally suppressed and Matt Lauer's kind of suspicion of that <laughs> as right. a reality, right? Yeah. So, um, so, so there's, there's that, right? I think that is, is true, and, um, and, and I'll say some of the things that I, I kind of hear within my own community among black gay men is a kind of fatigue around specific mm -hmm. kinds of direct targeting, and I think that, so there's a way in which tar like kind of specific targeting feels stigmatizing, right? And I think um, we haven't figured that out, right? And, and, and that sort of difference between, um, you know, what for us as public health folks feels like we're reaching out to specific communities and what communities respond to as, oh, you think I'm doing something, you know, fuck you basically, right? I mean, I think is, I think the, the tension um, and I think it's true around PrEP because I think, um, I think some of it is a resource issue where health departments or states that are making decisions about, you know, kind of targeting PrEP efforts to, you know, MSM or trans women or what have you. And, I, and I, there's more kind of blowback happening from, you know, women's groups around, you know, women should be um, also a part of the mix in terms of who should get access to PrEP, which I, I support for that reason, but also because I think some of the stigma around, like what does it mean to be on PrEP 
and carry and have a Truvada prescription and what does it mean when people come to the house and visit and whatever. And I think even for black gay men, as much as that gets normalized, right, in the community and they're, they're, you know, they don't have to explain to everybody what it is or what, you know, like those sorts of things, um, because it becomes a broader sort of community conversation will probably go a longer way to decreasing stigma and I think increasing people's um, willingness to, to use PrEP and stay adherent because their aunties they use it or they heard it on, you know, found during the morning show or these, yeah. di you know, like different things that are not just targeted at them specifically but create a different kind of community conversation and acceptance, right, of, of, of PrEP, in, for instance, as a particular kind of strategy. Comments from the panel. Thank well, you. For I, the I thought the um, I didn't see the Charlie Sheen <laughs> interview. Uh, I wished I had, and I'll probably get a chance to do it now that we have the uh, internet. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but but the um, but the truth of the matter is that <coughs> the the press doesn't pay attention to some of these issues. Uh, they don't. They, they, they play such an important role in educating the American people without a target audience, but just people to understand things. And I recall that uh, when we were dealing with HIV/AIDS ear early on, the press was all over it when it was possible to be spread through casual contact. They were all over it that it's a gay disease, and then a complacency set in uh, and nobody was talking about it and I got a call one time from one of the television shows, uh, uh, Sunday news shows and they said, well we want you to come on our show if it turns out that Rock Hudson really has AIDS. <laughs> <laughs> but if he doesn't, forget about it, we're going to do another topic. <laughs> so, you kn it's, uh, uh, so it's episodic and not a coherent way of communicating news to people. Uh, in fact, uh, I can't even bear to watch the nightly news anymore because they don't even talk about news. It's all stories that have been market tested <laughs> that might attract the broadest audience to buy the products that they're advertising. It's not even news. And they cut back on their yeah. news reporting staff and, and things like that. But th there is a a lack of responsibility in the public news sector about things that people ought to know and uh, and they look for only ways to cover it when there's some exceptional yeah. situation. So if you have a young kid doesn't know about these things, one of the places he would know is if his family and he picked it up from the, the conventional media yeah. and they're not doing their job. Well, I, I certainly um, agree with you, Congressman, and I don't think we should let journalists off the hook. Um, I don't think any of us should be off the hook, and we need to continue to uh, work with them to try to help them develop a, a deeper, more comprehensive understanding of health and health reporting. But I would say what you, what you just said, I'm sorry, what was your name? Kenyon. Kenyon, what you just said to me is the pluperfect example of why community needs to work with organized public health because they can help keep it fresh and keep it real. Um, and there may be other channels of communication that are more important than sort of the more traditional channels of communication. But I, I think that's why I really believe this. It's not, it's not just saying the right thing. If we're going to have successful public health programs, they have to be substantially informed by and supported by the communities for whom they're intended. Otherwise, there's a, a substantial disconnect and money is, is not being used effectively. So the examples you gave, again, are reasons why we have to continue to support this reaching out and, and bi-directional communication from various communities with more traditional organized public health systems so we can in fact ensure that what's being developed and promoted means something and is consequential for the people for whom it's intended. Uh, you just made the perfect case for that in the examples that you gave. Um, I do think there needs to be a balance to get back to your other issue. There does need to be a continual balance um, between targeted and broad-based. 
I would come back to the data issue. I mean, what's really going to inform that in the end is, is it working? Not only are we reaching people, but is it having the intended effect? Mm -hmm. So there's no magic, for, I mean, a lot of people on this panel, David included, have spent a lot of their career looking at this issue of what is the optimal combination of putting these elements together. The sad reality is we don't have a magic formula. I mean, we have information to guide and inform us, but I think even after we do that, we have to make sure that we have the monitoring systems in place to say, okay, that part of it worked, this part didn't work so well, let's go back and try to figure out wh what it was that was missing or we can do better. Uh, but it's a continual, programs aren't, I mean, they're living, they're, they, they have to continually evolve uh, as circumstances change and people change. Okay, thank you very much for the question, appreciate it. I think um, as we're getting closer to the end of time, there's one more question I wanted to ask about coordination of services, and then Josh, I'll turn it to you for the last words, see if there's any other last questions, uh, and to wrap us up. Um, in the fourth part of the strategy, there aren't any quantitative goals, but really focuses on coordinating our public and private sector services, and then local, state, and federal activities, and then across the different federal agencies. And I wanted to ask in general if there are any uh, sort of comments or reactions to that about kind of best practices to do that. And, and I guess the more pointed question I wanted to ask is uh, it's, it's a very common refrain now when we talk about services uh, to hear in, in D.C. that, uh, by the way, there won't be much more money anytime soon, um, it, which raises the question about strategic redirection of money. Um, and if, if it is true, I mean, one, one issue is, is it really true there won't be any new resources? A, a different question is, if that is true, um, what's the optimal way of thinking about sort of strategic redirection? Is it useful to think about sort of having a pool of money that you try and move money from one place to the other to meet the goals of the national strategy? Or do you just assume that the money is sort of allocated as it is and uh, that's the way it will forever be? But I wanted to raise this issue about coordination and then the also the issues of redirection in an era of limited resources. And I know you're looking right at me, David, since, yeah. <laughs> since I'm currently employed by the federal government. Yeah. Um, on the two, two comments about that, on the, the first comment um, about is it really true there's, there's not more money, um, I, I guess one, one observation I would make, I don't know how we do this, but I would like us to continue to try to really educate policymakers um, to embrace the World Health Organization of health being more than the absence of disease. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, I don't think that's gonna solve all the realities, but I, I do think we need to get people to think more broadly about what the investment is. Congressman Waxman noted this, I think, at the, the mm -hmm. top of the presentation to think more broadly about what the investment is. And I think when people do that, we might be able to look more broadly at the gross national product and not just say, well, we already have this in this health pot, so how do we divide that? Um, on the second question of coordination, I think it does make a difference. Uh, it is any of us who've worked in systems, uh, whether those are you know, state systems, academic systems, local systems, understand the challenges of trying to coordinate. But I think there can be some real payoffs. Uh, and at, at the federal level, I think we've made some progress. We've got a long way to go. But I do believe there's some capacity there that hasn't been tapped that can really result in changes on the ground for people at risk for people living with HIV. Um, I will also say at a state level, Na NASTAD, the National Association Alliance, excuse me, the National Alliance of State and Territorial AIDS Directors recently put out a position statement on health systems integration. And one of the major focuses of that document was to say to state and local AIDS directors, you really need to understand and get cozy with your state Medicaid directors. <laughs> and you need to start making connections there. And uh, you know, you're not gonna change the world overnight, but you need to start making connections there 
so you can try to find ways to get more support, even in states that aren't expanding Medicaid, to get more support for clinical preventive services like routine HIV testing and viral hepatitis screening. So I, I do think there's work to be done there. As you know, there are academic disciplines that look at you know the science of collaboration and uh, uh, public policy people who make their career in that. I think we can do a better job at the federal, at the state, and at the local level of bringing these systems together to work for the benefit of our clients. And uh, maybe, oh, go, go ahead, ahead Tim, I was please. going to yeah. say um, that I do, first of all, think it's realistic that in the uh, next few years there aren't going to be very many new resources mm -hmm. put into this. Um, the political um, environment is actually uh, quite the contrary. But I also want to agree with Ron and with the uh, basis for your question. There's a lot of uh, coordination and consolidation that could be done. Um, years ago when I was the Medicaid director for the federal government, I tried to bring some public health um, agenda stuff from the CDC, which I knew well, into CMS, which I didn't know so well at the time. And in at least two states, I actually introduced the state Medicaid director to his or her state health officer. Um, that they had never actually met each mm. other in two different states. Mm -hmm. um, and I assume the same thing is yeah. quite true with yeah. uh, state AIDS directors as well. And I would tell you from my current position of looking at these things that there's a lot of Medicaid money that can be used towards public health yep. ends, including in data systems. Yep. Um, that the Medicaid program provides a substantially enhanced matching yep. rate from the yep. federal level yep. for data systems. And I think public health people have not taken full advantage to the, uh, to the yep. especially since so many of these are diseases of poverty, as I was saying earlier, that the pu public health people haven't taken full advantage of the Medicaid data systems, which are by and large paid for by the federal government on an ongoing mandatory spending basis. So Josh, we're down to our last five minutes. Why don't I turn the podium over to you for any last questions and maybe you can close us out too. Okay. Um, well, I wanted to thank everybody for, for coming into such an interesting uh, discussion. It really ranged across decades, uh, demographics and topics, but had a few really interesting uh, themes, particularly um, the idea that it, a comprehensive look at HIV is necessary, was necessary then, and is even more necessary now. And, it, um, and also um, that HIV doesn't stand alone. It is in some ways a model. Um, in some ways, a kind of the uh, microcosm of some of the challenges of facing the healthcare system, um, but that we can learn a lot from some of the incredible advances that were made that really uh, helped a lot of patients as we think about the future. So I, I th thought it was really valuable. I wanted to thank um, you, David, um, Congressman Waxman, and uh, all the rest of the panelists for such an interesting discussion. This will be archived. So when you, you know, this co conversation comes up, you can point people back to this discussion. Um, if you missed the um, interview that David did with um, uh, Professor Westmoreland and Congressman Waxman this morning on the early days of HIV and uh, what was going on in Congress and the first hearings, it was a really interesting discussion. That will also be uh, on the website um, uh, very soon. Josh, if I could. Sure. Um, I think one other thing that this panel has shown is that um, people from different disciplines and at different levels of, uh, of government and participation actually um, have a lot to learn from each other. I find it humbling to be with people um, who are working so much with the uh, real disease on the ground as opposed to the abstractions that I spend my life working on. And it reminds me of um, an incident years and years ago, about the time that the Ryan White Act was enacted. Um, when one of the AIDS groups were having their AIDS lobby day, when they come to Washington and lobby members of Congress to talk about um, their issue. And I was visited by a guy from Texas. Um, I was working for a guy from California, <laughs> not a guy from Texas. And he said, I just want to thank you for the work that you do in dealing with the homophobes and the Reagan administration and the budget stuff. And I said, oh, you're welcome. Thank you for coming by. What do you do? And he said, I work with HIV-infected runaway uh, injection, injecting gay youth. And I said, and you think I have a hard job? <laughs> Thank you. So I think one of the other lessons is as we try to figure out how to bring power to different communities is also how much we have to uh, learn from each other. Great. That's terrific. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>